Hey, Edward Dodge here with uh, Bruce DeTorres, Lost Goddess IO, uh, next episode. So we're just going to continue our conversation we're having about uh, environmental stuff. But first, uh, talk to Bruce a little bit. Talk about Bruce's new book, God, School, 9-11, and JFK. Uh, we're both writers at uh, Trine Day Publishing out of Oregon with uh, the lovely uh, Chris Milligan. So part of our mission here is to talk Trine Day. So uh, let's hear about your book a little bit there, Bruce. Uh, thank you. Uh, it came out last year, and like the title says, I did a lot of thinking and research. Woohoo! There it is. Dodge. Um, about these things, the subtitle, The Lies That Are Killing Us and the Truth That Sets Us Free. Uh, if you go to brucedatoris.com, you'll see amazing reviews. It's an honor and a privilege to be a Trine Day author with Ed in Chris's stable of print he's printed or he's published over 120 books in the last 20 years books that the mainstream won't touch knowledge information stories and perspectives uh, that we're never supposed to see that challenge the official story of many things especially the kennedy assassination to reveal whose hands the country is really in because well read my book it's only 175 pages go to brucetorres.com See the amazing reviews. See if it's right for you. And uh, get in touch with me if you'd like. I'm trying to really promote it heavily these days. Thank you, Ed. Yeah, you know, actually, let's, uh, let's go ahead and talk about that a little more. Actually, let's just, let's just talk about this for a moment, minute. Um, the, uh, you know, I haven't gotten too far into your book, but there was a couple of things I picked on right away. Um, one was this idea of the lies, you know, the lies that are killing us and the truth that shall, truth that shall set us free. Um, because this totally dovetails with my work, you know, we're talking about different centuries, but the idea is the same is that our institutions and our institutional authorities routinely and readily lie to us in order to maintain their veneer of institutional power. And this is true across so many institutions and across so many centuries. Um, so, you know, I talk about lies in the Bible, but, you know, Bruce is talking about you know, lies in our current administrations and our current era of governance, of which there's loads of lies. Um, and we're just routinely being lied to. And that was one thing that started me down my whole life mission when, like, when I was 17 and realizing that we are being lied to. Um, for me, it was the, uh, it was a combination of things, but the, the real trigger was reading Jack Hare's The Emperor Wears No Clothes. Do you know this book? about no, how, do you uh, how do you spell his last name h-e-r-e-r -E -E jack Herer, like terror uh, but that's the book about uh about hemp and marijuana about how that marijuana is and is actually is also hemp and has this proud history as a fiber and was all our founding fathers were growing it thomas jefferson and george washington were writing and growing about hemp and yeah. they couldn't yeah. get enough of it because they needed to build our navy and real reading that stuff when i was a teenager and realizing that we were being completely lied to because like, so I grew up in Washington, DC. My father worked in the government. My, my friends and peers were like the children of government types and politicians and things. And so, you know, when they came in our classroom and said, you guys are the future leaders of America, like it wasn't just facetious. Like our parents in my class were like today's leaders of America. Like there were some prominent politicians and things that I went to school with, went to school with their kids. Um, and so I remember just being shocked that, you know, it's one thing to lie to the, under, I don't mean to sound so smug about this, but like, it's one thing to like lie to the underclasses or lie to the despised, um, outsider classes. But I am like, again, I don't want to like come off like arrogant, but I'm like coming out of the white Protestant ruling class. Like, like everyone's got a story of where they come from. That's, that's where I come from. Like my you know, my, my family, I grew up in DC and my family is in the government and my, I know okay. these people out of the Ivy league and stuff Pol like political, uh, political masters of the universe. Yeah. So, um, the sense that they were lying to us too, that they were lying to their own children, um, really struck with me that these lies were so deeply embedded in our culture. And I really wanted to understand why, like, why are they lying to us? Like, what's the purpose of these lies? And that led me down a whole journey of my own, but it dovetails with the journey you've been on and you're chasing down a different set of lies. Um, 
that have also shaped our culture. Yeah. So yeah. What lies, and, what lies were getting you, Bruce? Well, the one that really opened the door was 9 11 in 2004. And as you'll see in the book, Ed, I call myself a lifelong reader starting in, in first grade. That's, that's all I did. And I fell in love with Abraham Lincoln, American history, the presidents, John F. Kennedy. I was reading them my whole life. After 2004, it was, you know, I went backstage, you know, the truth behind the scenes, what, what mainstream calls conspiracies. And I, I, spent you know from 2016 uh you know like 16 years organizing my thoughts about it about seven years writing the book based on everything i had you know read you know through my whole life so you know the demonization of marijuana cannabis in the 1930s that's in my book and the founding and the use of hemp that's it all that's in my book each sentence i tried to have a fact in there it's only 175 pages, and then there's 43, 46 pages of sources. And I, I can't wait to hear what you say after you read it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the hemp story is so fascinating. That's actually what got me into the whole goddess thing was that I had been studying. The history of cannabis goes all the way back to the dawn of the Neolithic Revolution. So you've got this unbroken thread of history all the way through human history where both the fiber and the drugs have always been present. Like they've, they never went away. So you can, you can, you can trace that, you know, and, and the usage is pretty continuous and the culture around it, because it, it has a certain type of behavior that it brings about, you get a certain set of cultural attributes. It's in, you know, cannabis is, is an aphrodisiac and it's involved in music and involved in spirituality. So you get these sort of, um, healing medicine, nutrition. Yeah. So, um, the, the sex and drugs connection basically is always been there. Like you can trace that all the way through human history. And if, you know, I was making this joke with a friend of mine, you know, the potheads always find one another. Like there's a certain personality type that's a stoner that like really likes THC and really likes cannabis. And it's not for everybody, but like there's certain personality types that can just consume huge amounts of cannabis and just be a-okay with their day-to-day -day lives. And it's, and it's a certain type of person, but those people always find one another. Like the heads always find each other. When you go to a new environment, a new school, a new town, a new state, yeah. like all the potheads, like there's like a magnetic gravity and they like find one another and you become friends with the other potheads. I found that you can do that with historical analysis too. You can go look yeah. in history and find where the potheads are. And, yeah. and it's a pretty consistent pattern. You're going to find prostitutes. You're going to find musicians. Um, and you're going to find this sort of non-Christian occult, what Christians would call a cult or paganism, but you find these alternative spiritualities. Um, and it tracks all the way through history in a pretty consistent way. It's like a, a consistent variable that you can track wow. for thousands and thousands of years. Have you ever wanted to write that up? Yeah, that's what I was writing. That's what History of the Goddess started as. And is, a lot was, of that, is a lot of that in History of the Goddess? Oh, yeah. The book began as a history of hemp. And halfway through, I turn it into a history of the goddess. So like half but, the book is just about cannabis. <laughs> so you got some stories, but you've got some stories in there about how uh, potheads and cannabis lovers find each other, that angle. Well, I don't know if I put that specifically in there, but. Um, well, then I want, I want you and Chris Bennett <laughs> to collaborate on something like that. <laughs> um, it is a bit interesting bit of historical uh, methodology though. Um, yeah. yeah. And, 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 but it, but I do talk about it in the sense that what I noticed was that the goddess traditions the goddess traditions, I say this repeatedly in the book, the goddess traditions are strongest where the cannabis grows thickest. So you find the places in the world where, where the hemp was growing a lot, and that's where you find the strongest representations of goddesses. And it's true today. You go to Humboldt County, California, where they've been growing marijuana for 20 years, and you'll find stuff about goddesses like all over the town. Goddess this, goddess that. It's all over the place. And Mother Earth stuff. It's true for the Hindus. It was true for the Scythians, um, all these different native cultures, the, the, the places where hemp was growing. And it's true in medieval Europe, where the, uh, the pagan tradition stuck around among the peasant farmers, far away from the cities and far away from the authorities. That's where the pagan culture is still stuck around because they never entirely went away in Europe. And those are where you find the hemp farmers too.
And I want to make the distinction between hemp, which does not have THC versus the cannabis that does for all the reasons you just said, just to circle that for anyone who's no, hearing that for the first point. time. In the Northern climates, yeah. you get, you get hemp without the THC and it's grown for fiber and the Southern climates it's grown for drugs and not for the fiber, but it's still right. the same plant. And right. um, in the central based- latitudes, like mm-hmm. around the black sea and around Turkey and Lebanon, it can be grown for all three types. It can be grown for the fiber and the drugs together. Um, and that's right. what you get back in the, you know, really ancient history. Right. And it's fascinating. And I bet it's in goddess. I know it's in my book, how mar- uh, cannabis marijuana was demonized through the twenties and thirties, maybe the 1910s, and then really made kind of illegal in 1937, definitely illegal by 1971. Why? Well, two things. It's popular, so it's going to create a black market. It's going to create huge slush funds for folks who deal with it, which include government law enforcement, the corrupt kind, right? But also to uh, dry, not compete with these kind of established industries of lumber and, and cotton and things like that. So it's a nefarious it's a nefarious history. That's all I want to circle is like, wow. Yeah, I have sort of, I can, I have my own sort of nuanced opinions on, on prohibition. I think it's mainly a power grab by law enforcement, um, especially with regards to making hemp illegal, because America was really the only part of the world where the hemp fibers were made illegal, where you couldn't grow the whole plant. Like communist China and Russia, which were traditional hemp growing countries all their right. entire history, they're fervently anti drug. You know, they're harshly, even harsher than we are on anti drug but they never stopped growing fiber hemp because fiber hemp doesn't produce any black market drugs. But in America, they lied and said the fiber hemp was producing black market <laughs> drugs and they banned the fiber hemp too. And the advantage of that for law enforcement was that fiber hemp, unlike marijuana, fiber hemp grows like weeds all over the country, like grows like dandelions all over America, all over the, all over the Midwest, all over the East Coast. It grew like crazy. Um, and so initially they were like, how could we possibly ban this? Because it's, you know, like you're trying to ban dandelions. But Anslinger, Harry Anslinger, the guy who was an architect of federal prohibition, he recognized that that was not a, not a bug, but a feature because it, it gave law enforcement these sort of carte blanche, carte blanche capacity to go into people's yards and say like, all right, well, those dandelions on your property are a felony. Now you're in trouble. And so that puts... You know, the entire, like, it's just a huge power grab by law enforcement to wield all sorts of powers that were never, um, you know, given to them constitutionally. And I'll tell you, you know. And against anyone that they don't like. And law enforcement is a tool or an arm of the rich of the rich who always want to control society to make us uh, mind-controlled workers and consumers. And also, throughout mankind's history, the fiber of hemp, which grows much quicker which can replace uh, trees to make paper. Um, it's much stronger and it has such a versatile use. It was used for paper, clothing, and the oils it could be used. And it can be used for you know the sails and the ropes growing much, much faster than anything else. It's just this amazing thing. And to demonize it, hearing how you just described it, maybe it made me see how the uh, chemical companies want to sell us insecticides. I wonder if eliminating the now illegal hemp was behind some of the I, 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 our property. I do think that the, the industrial hemp conspiracy theories are, are overstated. Like that was what Jack, that was Jack Harris sort of big claim to fame was that hemp was made illegal because of this conspiracy with DuPont and stuff. Those, that's not actually true. Um, the hemp, hemp was like um, not really a profitable crop, even though it's very useful. It was never profitable because it's so labor intensive. Um, it's so incredibly labor intensive that it was never, um, American farmers never put in the effort to really get good at it. And so even though hemp grows great in America, we never had the processing culture in this country. And the only time we had even a reasonable industry was slave-based in Kentucky. And we did not produce the highest quality. We produced like mid-tier. It wasn't ship grade at all. All of our maritime, the highest quality hemp goes for shipbuilding. And that stuff was all imported all throughout the entire colonial era. We never grew it ourselves because we didn't have oh. the production techniques to make it high quality. The Russians, it all came from Russia. Shipbuilding for the sails and the ropes? Yeah, the ropes and the rigging. Um, yeah. It's the rigging mainly that hemp is needed for. Thanks. 
Well, we have an intention for this episode. This was a very valuable tangent, but I just I'm aware uh, of our no, time. We'll stick to this. Our we don't time. need to go into the, in the, uh, the we can do oh. the uh, the the um, green flash yeah. one on another episode. I like the, the the cannabis stuff is important, and the uh, the um, just the 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 nature of of lies that we've been taught. Um, the idea that God the Father rules alone, and there is no Mother Nature is not sacred. Um, this ties back to, you know, my argument has been that with monotheism, they persecute the traditions of the mother to keep them away. Transgender people, gay people, um, plant drugs, all this stuff gets persecuted because they remind you of the mother and they, and they bring back these traditions. And so the father only folks can't tolerate that. They have to persecute it. Um, and this ties back to why. My initial question, why do we hate marijuana? Why would the West, why would we embrace alcohol and tobacco, which are totally destructive, but hate marijuana? It didn't make sense to me as a kid. And the racism argument didn't really quite hold water either because conservative blacks and conservative Mexicans hated marijuana every bit as much as conservative whites. So it wasn't that it was just a black white issue. What I ultimately realized after many years was that it was a religious issue, that it was Christians hated marijuana and non-Christians embraced it. And so if you go to Mexico, the Mexican Catholics hated marijuana more than the whites ever did. And Mexico made marijuana illegal before we did. And they were much more fervent about it. But it came from Catholic traditions, um, whereas the Mexican indigenous people embraced it. Um, this is actually a big story in Mexican. The story of marijuana in Mexico is important because people don't realize how demonized it was in Mexico before it was imported in the United States. All the stories of marijuana causing murder and violence and mayhem. Those stories came from Mexico. They came with the plant. Um, that reputation was established in the in 19th century in Mexico, but among the Catholics, not among the indigenous. And leveraged um, by and leveraged by law enforcement down there for the other purposes you said. Yeah. So, like in the 19th century in Mexico, it was a defense against a murder charge. Like alcoholism and marijuana use was like you could use that as like an insanity defense against a murder charge. Say, I, I didn't know what I was doing because I was high on marijuana. That was actually a legitimate legal defense in Mexico for a long, for many decades, um, up into the 20th century, because it had such a bad reputation. Um, so yeah, and, and Mexico made marijuana illegal before we did and insisted on the war on drugs harder than we ever did. That's actually get lost in the, uh, in the conversation a lot, was that it's not just America imposing this on everybody else. Prohibition is international. It wasn't just because um, it happened internationally before it came to the United States. Well, I see it as a way to enrich law enforcement by, uh, by the corruption. and the, Now, and the Americans the, the, turned it up to 11. Don't get me wrong. The Americans, like, uh, you know, they dialed yeah. it up to the most extremes. Um, yeah. And there's so much, you know, and, like, you got property forfeitures today where you could just be driving in your car. And if you've got a bunch of money, like, you know, thousands of dollars cash, and you get pulled over for a minor traffic stop, they'll look through your car. And if they find a bunch of money, they just take the money and call it an asset seizure and say that like, oh, well, it looks like drug money to me. And they don't even have to charge you with any crimes at all. They can let you go on your way. You don't have to be arrested, but they'll take all the money you've got. And so people yeah. will be driving around with their life savings, $60,000, $90,000, because they're going to go buy something. Right. Which you used to be allowed to do, you know, paying cash was never a problem. But now like they'll just seize it, call it a drug seizure and never right. charge you with any crimes. And then like they just take your money. Which is what's fascinating about the literature of anarchism and anarchy, which uh, portrays in general terms, all taxes that is, is theft and the government is just, uh, you know, authorized mafia. Cause look, look at the, you know, the thuggery you just described. That's just thuggery, right? Totally. It's totally just thuggery. And, you know, unfortunately, we need a certain amount of government and we need a certain amount of services and, and, and infrastructure. So it's a little bit unavoidable to have some taxes. But, you know, I appreciate the sentiment that um, it reminds me of that famous quote from the Marine General from like the 1920s or 30s saying how he spent his entire life basically as a front man for industry to go beat up on third world countries, you know, all through like the teens and 20s where he was like, you know, fighting all these wars in Latin America just for the defense of, you know, rubber barons and banana barons. 
He's in my book, Ed. That's Major General Smedley D. Butler, <laughs> the highest, All the, right, General highest Smedley. the highest uh, ranking Marine at the time, most decorated. And he wrote a book called War is a Racket, where he makes the point you just made. Yeah, it's a famous point, and it's a good point. Um, the war on drugs is a complete racket. It is a total racket. Like, they're not even intending to stop the flow of drugs. They don't want to stop the flow of drugs. The entire thing is to intended to empower law enforcement. And so from that perspective, it's a raging success. I mean, the war on drugs, from the perspective of keeping money and power flowing to law enforcement, it is a total 100% raging success. And yeah. all the drugs in the streets is, is, is not a bug, it's a virtue. It's a, it's a feature of the program. They don't want to solve the problem. And above and around law enforcement, uh, I know where the, you know, the, the smuggling that's facilitated by elements of our intelligence community, Absolutely. elements of law enforcement at the government, at the national level, at the military level, at the CIA level, elements of it going back through all of human history. Daniel Hopsicker is an author and an investigator, independent journalist who's written a lot about this. He's a good friend with Chris Milligan, our publisher. He's got a new book coming out called Gangster Planet. And in interviews, he has said, probably before prostitution or neck and neck with it, it's the oldest profession, drug smuggling, because humanity will always, has always, and still does, and always will, according to Daniel Hopsicker. There'll be some people who say, who say, wow, there's a lot of money in drugs. People really love checking out of their reality for a while. And that's that. Yeah. To that point, to that point, um, Hashish and opium both have been go back time immemorial. Um, and, but the money's in opium. The money's not in hashish. The money never was in hashish. The money was always in opium. And to that point, the opium has funded armies for centuries. Um, and in the 19th century, the opium trade was the biggest part of the colonial, uh, you know, Pacific Rim trade was for the British and the Dutch and the French. Um, yeah. It was a massive, massive component of their revenues. It was like a third of the income of the British East India Company was the opium trade. I mean, it's just these massive revenues all Chris, through the 1800s. Chris Milligan says in episode 79 with Ron Felber of the Journey podcast at tryingday.com, which I have to edit today, which is going to be posted on Tuesday, that at least since the 1830s, he said opium has been the uh, biggest trading uh, thing on the planet. And I didn't have a chance to, to quantify yeah, you know, that, but I, I think I, that's what he said. It, it's definitely up there. There's no question it's up there. I mean, what else is going to be a bigger trade? You've got weapons, you've got petroleum, um, opium. It's, um, it's, it's one of the world's great commodities. There's no question about it. And in the 1800s, the uh, first... Some of the first biggest and enduring fortune, fortunes made by some American families was facilitating and participation and investing in the opium trade uh, in the, in, from Asia, in and around Asia, the Delanos uh, of Roosevelt's. Uh, there's a big list. And those are the Skull and Bones. A lot of Skull and Bones families facilitated it. And one could say that, you know, an, uh, uh, an, an alien coming and looking at this planet for the very first time would analyze everything and say, okay, the major or one of the major things they do is, hmm, you know, sell, sell drugs, but in this underhanded way, like making it illegal so that the ruling class can live in palaces. In, in other words, a lot of the royal families, had, I believe my understanding is they built and still maintain their fortunes on this illegal drug trade. Well, look at the Sacklers and the modern day opium trade. Um, Right, with the uh, I mean, oxycotton, just, right, yeah. So a Alfred McCoy is the guy who's written the best books, in my opinion, um, Politics of Heroin. He was back in the, uh, he was documenting the CIA drug trade back in the 1970s on the ground in Cambodia. Um, and he wrote a series of books, or actually this one book has got a series of editions. It's called The Politics of Heroin. I highly recommend it. I've got it here somewhere. Um, and he documents the trade. He makes one really important point, makes a lot of important points. But one point that stuck out is that the flip side of prohibition is protection. So if you're the prohibitionist, that gives you the implicit ability 
to give protection to a, an approved drug dealer. Um, for your so slice, for your this slice. This is what this is what Anslinger did in the 1930s. His whole mission was Federal Bureau of Narcotics was to crack down on the opium trade. You know, the marijuana stuff was a sideshow. The main business was opium. But also what he did was he granted the licenses to the pharmaceutical firms that could do the legal opium trade. Anslinger did both of those personally. So he personally gave out the four or five industrial licenses for industrial opium. And those pharmaceutical companies, none of which are brand names, they're all like names you've never heard of. They're none of the public facing brands. Um, they're all these obscure names. But these were the mega rich, you know, granddaddies behind the pharmaceutical firms. And they were some of Anslinger's best friends and biggest supporters mm. and biggest political supporters. And, and that has been true all along. So the pharmaceutical industry, so when Anslinger told them, hey, we want to make marijuana illegal, we need you to take marijuana out of the pharmacopoeia and stop right. telling people it's a medicine, they were okay with it. They, been, they went along with it because first of all, they didn't make any money off marijuana in the first place, so it wasn't profitable. So it was, they were willing to sacrifice it. Yeah. And it was a quid pro quo. Like right. I'm giving you the licenses for opium that are incredibly valuable. So I need you to toe my line on everything else. And they did it perfectly happy to do it. Why wouldn't they? You know, also in my book, I, I review a lot of this history of the pharmaceutical industry up to the modern day. I squeezed in a new chapter called COVID-19 just before my deadline for the final submission of the final manuscript. And it's stunning to see the petroleum industry led by the Rockefellers develop petroleum products into our lives, not only our fuel, but our fertilizers and our food processes that arguably has made us much sicker than we ever would. In 1900, cancer occurred very, very rarely. Today, one out of two or one out of three Americans get some form of cancer. And the, um, the anesthetizing of, of America, we take we're 5% of the world's population I think we're 45% of the world's uh, prescription drug users or, or something <laughs> like that. It's, it's, it's absolutely cruel. Somewhere in this conversation, as we were reviewing some American history, I thought to myself, we really were created to be one major thing by the elite of the elite, the rich, the richest of the rich who really want to run the planet like a plantation of slaves. America, one could argue, was created to be a mind controlled culture of workers and consumers who obediently follow the propaganda in media. And there have been PhD dissertations written on these themes. Yeah. You know, it's bothered me since I was a child. Why are we always referred to as consumers? Why are we not referred to as producers? Why are we not referred to in some way that's more, um, embracing of our like in, in agency and soulfulness and uh, and intrinsic worth like because like if you're just labeled as a consumer and your identity is what you consume your value is in i consumed the best stuff that makes me the best person it's this very shallow cultural mindset that well, speaks to like what you're saying um that it's like taking away our, our agency and humanity um, well my friend you've you've just brought us to modern times according to many smart analysts of society with the phones in our hands, generations now are nothing but consumers of entertainment and content. And now with the lockdowns in the last couple of years, it's even, there's even more pressure or incentive to not think of ourselves as people who do anything we just receive. And right. It's part of the, the decadence and the corruption and what a lot of people forecast. Well, all these rotten things are just going to collapse. You yourself have declared yourself a pessimist. You don't really see Kali is solutions. Kali Pardon? is coming. That's my Kali is coming for us. Who's Kali? Kali. Kali is the Hindu goddess of death and destruction. She's like dripping in blood with the skulls. And Ah, well, yeah. Now, also, there's plenty in my book, and I, and I predict in Hidden Goddess, that says, listen, if we can embrace the fact that reality is spiritual, the instant we have a good intention, a positive intention, a loving, life-affirming intention, and even quantum physics backs this up, it 
starts to transform things and things. And when more of us have that consciousness, <laughs> there's always, there's always hope. I want to address one quick thing. Um, in this episode, I've mentioned, and it, it has come out that I haven't read your book yet. And, but in previous episodes, you see me praise it. That's because folks I've seen and heard Ed in a lot of interviews and as the marketing director for Trine Day, I have read extensively the material about his book, and I just got it in the mail the other day, and I'm going to dig into it. So there was nothing duplicitous or you know fraudulent about me saying in previous episodes, his book is great. I know his book is great. <laughs> well, I'm just getting started on your book too, but um, I do enjoy that the... Uh... I do enjoy the um, how it dovetails together and and the stuff that Chris has been doing for years on exposing these rackets and exposing these lies. Um, you know, it's, it's a hard journey to, you put yourself outside the establishment. It's not like it, you're making a lot of money when you're on, as an outsider. It's um, not a highly rewarded kind of place to be. So but it's, it's the um, profile. It's the profile of the heads you described earlier. You know, the musicians, the uh, prostitutes, all of Jesus's friends. You know, who, like, who look at, who hear the mainstream story and see everybody marching in lockstep and getting crew cuts and getting business degrees and joining the military. There's a certain type of folk that just love loves to identify with the team, the big corporation, the brand, and and doing what they're quote unquote supposed to. And then there are the pot smoking or other rebels or artists or free thinkers who just say, I want to think that through a little bit more for myself. I'm going to make a decision for my gut about what's more right for me. The rebels and the rebels. I mean, I think that tension has always been there in society. I'm sure oh, yeah. that's always been the case. Ditto. Beyond doubt. And these are the folks who will agitate with uh, uh, minority opinions and who move progress, whether it's abolish slavery or rights for women or the right to organize in unions and co do collective bargaining against mankind's perpetual foe. The small percent of us who lust for power over others. And, and there's a lot of psychological analysis in my book of that type of thinking and how we're all, we're all prone to it until you love yourself completely, and then you don't need to have power over others. I suspect that the lust for power over others are the folks who subconsciously are panic-stricken because they sense that they have no power over themselves. They were not loved and nurtured well enough as babies, infants, and children. And that panic-driven anxiety makes them need to control something. It's the same impetus of the young girl or boy who cuts themselves because they need or stops eating and becomes anorexic. They need to control something because inside they've got this panic of, I don't know who I am. I don't feel safe and I'm going to inflict it on others. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it is an interesting, there's this interesting paradox about the lust for material stuff and how like miserable it can make pe some of the rich, some of the richest people living in luxury are some of the most miserable people and some of the happiest people most fulfilled people are living lives of poverty and doing charity and like they, they're living their lives with grinning ear to ear and they're wearing rags and yet yeah. the people that are living in these mansions are all like so vile um and unhappy and miserable on the inside and it's just weird it's yeah. one of these paradoxes of life that that um that the mystics have been talking about for millennia and you see yes. it over and over again. And what the mystics have been saying is happiness in a, in a modern modernism, happiness is an inside job, you know, and it comes down. This is what the, the purpose of all meditation. In my opinion, here's a short seminar on metaphysics. You are here. Okay. That's all you are. And when we can be happy here, like Gandhi in a loincloth, no earthly possessions. You know, the people in rags you just described, they're not happy because they're in rags. They're in rags because they're happy. Like Mother Teresa, right. her life changed when she just hugged and comforted a dirty, diseased, disgusting, dying person. You know, and the fellows, the sisters in her order were saying, what are you doing? 
but there's work to do back at the convent. And she just fell in love with, this is real. This person's right here, right now. And they need my love and comfort. And when you can experience love and comfort, you, you, don't, you don't need the mansions. You don't need the 10% growth every year in, in your uh, portfolio. You know, but if you don't know how to be happy and you buy the brainwashing of modern culture and advertising, ooh, a car, ooh, a big house, oh, an, uh, one more gold chain than the guy next to me is wearing, that's what's going to make me happy? You are a mind slave on a gerbil wheel with no Yeah, end. you're trying to fill this black hole in your heart with like all of this stuff and it's just an endless hole and you just keep feeding more stuff into it and it doesn't fill the hole. It doesn't. If you don't love yourself, like yeah. it's very difficult to love the people around you and it's very difficult to like be Possible. Um, a kind person really, even if you're trying to be kind, but you gotta, if you don't have that self-love, uh, everything else back flows from that. It's really... Yeah, man. And, it, and it's not really a function of being outwardly kind or not. You could be outwardly kind and still like totally not have self-love. Um, and, and it'll, it'll yeah. impact the rest of your interactions with people. Yeah. And that's why the first thing inscribed on the temple of Apollo at uh, Delphi, I understand was know thyself. And, and it's spiritual- one of those Gnostic teachings too. Spiritual practices get you there, you know, they get you there, which, which is, they get you here. They realize everything else is just a thought. I'm here. Everything else is a thought. The idea of Bruce de Torres, the memory of my life. It's not who and what. Anyway. Yeah. And the Gnostics taught the same stuff. Yeah. And so it's interesting. I was talking to uh, John Pierce, um, a tippling philosopher on his podcast yesterday, the other day, and he's a big, um, so he's, he's like a hard atheist and he doesn't believe in free will. And so we we're having a discussion about like, um, you know, the nature of the divine and stuff. And, you know, I, I do believe in free will. I do believe that there is a soul and that there is this spark of the divine within us and getting to the point of know yourself. And like, that's how you get to know God because God is inside you. But if you don't believe in God, then you don't believe that there's any God inside you. Um, and I, I, I partially agree with them. I do think that, you know, nine, you know, arguably 99.999% of the, what we're doing every day is stuff we're subjected to do like stuff that from the outside forces that compel us to do things all day long, go to work, go to school, do your family obligations, go to the bathroom, even your body betrays you. Right. Like, um, or it's also the result of ha- our habits just are the way our, our habits and our, and our addictions, our addictions, yeah. you know, yeah. um, but there is that, like, there is that 0. 0.0001 inside of you that hates it, that knows you're being pushed around and desires to do something different, d- desires to do something creative, that the artistic impulse that, that is totally irrational. Like, why would an artist, hmm. like any of us, spend years on some project that is only fulfilling to themselves that no one else is ever going to see? I know I felt this way. Like, if I didn't write this book, it didn't matter if anyone else never read it. I had to write it for myself. There was a bucket list project that I had kicking around in my brain for over 20 years. And if I didn't ever get it done, I was never going to forgive myself. And I just had to sit down and just like sacrifice and do the work. And then we'll see if anyone reads it. Um, yeah. yeah. But I just, I just, it was like this something intrinsic, something internal. It was not an external thing. It was internal and it was utterly irrational. It made no sense materially because I didn't make like, you know, wasn't a material reward but Um, you were trusting an impulse and you know the real wise ones the mystics even say hey listen since we're spiritual beings uh there's a great idea that i love ed that we come here with a mission we come here to to find and create and implement and teach and experience certain things so i think that was your impulse to to write your book one that's an example of this has to be, I've got it. So I'm here to deliver this, give birth to this thing, even if I'm the only one who sees it, you know? Yeah. You know, and religious people talk all the time about finding meaning and purpose in your life. And then the atheists are like, why well, find me, my meaning from like my clubs or walking my dog or my, but that's not, that's all very shallow. You know, it's not dealing with like the bigger things in life and the existential things in life. Well, um, the real, the real mystics say, you know, listen, look within for the end answering is inside you you know and anyone who's indulges creativity whether it's writing a poem or drawing a picture or writing a book often frequently discovers 
the power of creativity, meaning there's an infinite amount of ideas that I can potentially get and draw from and pull from. And then you start to feel the infinite power of being a creative artist. And then there are a lot of, there's a lot of wisdom that says, listen, your whole life is a work of art, you know? And that's how intentionally we can choose every single word we say, everything we do. And it became, the singer Cher said famously, everyone invents themselves. Some just have more imagination than others. Hmm. Also along these lines, when the Rolling Stones were getting popular in the 1960s and Satisfaction was their first, I think, runaway hit, Keith Richards told the story of how, well, that, that lick just came to you in the middle of the night. And back then I was in the habit of had a tape recorder next to my bed because I wanted to capture cool things. And that's where satisfaction came from. And at some point in his life, he said, the songs are out there, man. Right. Yeah. I wanted to get to this point. I was, this is exactly what I was getting. You're leading perfectly what you're leading to is that I describe in my book and I take this metaphor from musicians who talk about that. They didn't write the song. They tuned it in. They plucked it out of the air. It came out of the ether and they just, are the, the, the vehicle by which it's being expressed, but they didn't like write it per se. They didn't invent this melody. They tuned it in. They, musicians read, talk about this all the time. I, I read a, a, a poet who said she was out in the field doing some work and she got to the point in her life where she said, I, could, I can feel when poems are coming. And she said, all of a sudden I dropped, whatever I had, and I was running to the house because I had to have a paper and pen because I felt a poem coming. And she wrote maybe one of her most famous poems that way. And she said, it's fleeting, you know, but my it comes writing like comes it. the same way. I can't, I can't make myself <laughs> write. I can, I can like block out time on the calendar, but if I don't have any inspiration, I can sit at my desk and I won't get anything done. Um, in other moments where it's like, I've got a moment of inspiration, I write out a bunch of stuff really fast and I well, you also you, you're describing also the jams that musicians have where one night's different or better than another because you know the gods show up you know jimmy page of led zeppelin talked about that a lot you know and in theater i was an actor for years uh, there are times when you're doing the you're just doing the same scene you've done a million times before and then just some magic happens and the audience influences it and now you now we could talk about the uh, what consciousness is and right. what's so really you here. On the first couple of pages of your book, one thing I did get to is you were talking about the infinite consciousness. And one of these discussions that like people like to have is that we don't really have a, uh, the scientists can't nail down the nature of consciousness. No one really knows like how to define consciousness or what it really is. And some people have described an idea that the universe is one big infinite consciousness. That God is one big infinite consciousness and that our brains are just sort of tuning it in. We're like radios that are like tuning in some aspect of this infinite consciousness and that I goes on that, inside I, of our brain. I think that's actually the leading concept these days among physicists. Not all physicists, because there's, there's mainstream academic physicists that run from any allusion to spirit or right. consciousness. But you also just well encapsulated and surmised a lot of ancient writing from the East and the Orient, the Zen traditions, the, uh, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, um, the poetry of Rumi, and even the essays of Ralph Waldo Emerson. You know, the concept you just said is on my first or second page of my book, and that was the original impetus for the book, the, the thrilling one, that life is something of, of an illusion. There is only one of us here because there, in reality, there is only one thing that exists, a field of infinite possibilities. We call it energy. The best we can say it in this time space linear experience we have with our five senses between meals and having to go to the bathroom is that energy infinite possibilities manifests as particles but they're not really particles and waves but they're not really waves what they really are at its core and we can't figure it out yet we don't have the technology yet is infinite possibilities and i'll add to that this chariot and i love it according to physics we are blinking in and out of existence. All of our atoms and molecules are blinking in and out of existence at such a high rate. We have the illusion of a continuity of uh, density and existence. And when we're out of existence, we're back. What we really are is infinite possibilities and we influence it. 
So we are, it's like a dance. And I like, that's a symbol for infinity, which is the insides going outside and the outsides going inside. And that's what this is on my book. It's the infinity symbol on its side with a little smiley face. Someone close to me said, oh, infinite happiness. And I said, well, it's just the infinity symbol um, because that's who and what we really are. And other observers of life say, this infinite field of infinite possibilities and consciousness is love. And I'll just submit to everyone what you felt with your mother, what you felt if you felt love or your brothers and sisters or your dogs and cats or your horses or just the breezes through the trees on a nice day or when you had just the right amount of dope and just the right music was on. When we pay attention, when we look in each other's eyes, we see and feel what's really real which is love. And it's that connection that makes us human, gives us hope. And that the mainstream and the culture is designed to suppress. So we don't know that we have the infinite capacity to create whatever we want based on love and fairness and equality for all. So they can control us and exploit us and sell us things. Yeah. And so we need a spiritual revolution. We need a reformation. Um, and this is where I, uh, where I break with like that, you know, the, 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 the conventional liberalism, which is like, they want to have a lot of rulemaking. I, I think we got to like dispense with the rulemaking, the technocratic rulemaking and focus on the spiritual values. And that if we align, if we get our spiritual values, right, then we can figure out the rules. But if you start it's hard with like, because go ahead. I'm saying Sorry. if you don't have the values, right. If you're making all this rulemaking without the values, is well, and, it could, and hearing spiritual values could be a real turnoff to someone who doesn't have a spiritual imagination. So there's got to be there's got to be an alternate way, like a other side of the coin way, to sell spiritual values to more people, even those who re recoil at the at the word spiritual. And then, and that's just that that's doable. I believe that's doable, you know, because the values would be sellable to humans who want life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all. But it's really turbocharged, and this is what I try in the book, is to inspire people to consider the things that I say can inspire a person to have a spiritual imagination. It's going to be different for everybody. Basically, just to get to the point, pay attention to the coincidences and think about what does it mean when you think of an old friend you haven't thought of in years? Wow. And half an hour later, they call and you haven't spoken in years. What does that mean? What thought went from whom to whom? And if thoughts can travel, are all thoughts everywhere in this model that there's only one infinite field of something and it's conscious? Does that make it one vast infinite mind? I think that's on page one or two of, of my book. And the other thing that could inspire a spiritual imagination is the thousands of documented near-death experiences and people who, kids who were born knowing Stuff that happened before they were born indicating reincarnation. Go develop a spiritual imagination, and then you won't take fear so seriously, and you'll appreciate the impact you can have on another when you exude and you want to love that other person. You want to see and you want to hear and you want to love that other person and just look at the transformation that makes in all your relationships at home and at work. Yeah, you know, um, I do think that that you know, love and compassion, it does end up being, if you want like the shortcut answer to what the mystics teach, it always comes back to love and compassion. And if you want to just like get the cliff notes and figure out what right. lesson you need to take home with you, it's right. love and compassion. Um, and, 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 here, and here's, here's the, 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 the cherry on that, I think is because to love another is to love yourself yeah. because there is no other. There's no place where you stop and I start. If this is one seamless field of one thing, and there's just the illusion of separation. So have yeah, you know, and I, and I really think that's a big part of the whole mystical quest is you arrive at these types of conclusions. This is what I noticed from doing comparative religion when I was, when I was younger was that the mystics all, they all dovetail and they don't really contradict. Once you get past the dogma and stuff, like they all start to come to the same conclusions. And it's yeah. this kind of stuff we're talking about, this oneness yeah. of all life the oneness yeah. of the entire universe, love and compassion and empathy, um, this connectivity, 
they always everybody comes back to these same teachings. I don't care if you're a Sufi or a Buddhist or a, or a Christian mystic. They right. all come back to the same set of <laughs> yeah, the same set of stuff. Yeah, and uh, you know it's thrilling. It's life empowering. You get to a certain age where you know you get convinced of it, and there's nothing better to do than to try to meditate and journal as an individual. I'm gonna love my life. I'm gonna love everyone and everything in it, especially when I'm alone in a room because we spend most of our time alone. And what kind of trash talk are we indulging? Are, do we even think about what we're thinking? Or does it just run us into upset and anxiety and fear? So folks, pay attention. Pay attention is the advice. Just pay attention. See what causes what. And it can open the door to all these lovely spiritual loving things that we're talking about. Yeah, I think there's a, uh, there's a, it's a beautiful world out there. There's a lot to, uh, I mean, it's a chaotic world, but there's so much beauty and, and to be enjoyed um, between the, you know, suffering and death. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, and to, right. And to, and to have this grounding, this foundation lets us as mature adults look at and deal with the horrible problems we have to deal with the cliffs we are racing toward. Yeah, we really are. Um, that's really tricky. How, how long have we been on this air, Bruce? Long enough. I, I, this was beautiful. Yeah, we could probably wrap it up. I think it's been a good one. Um, we'll have to do more trying day. We should get some more trying day folks around. Um, and we should definitely try and talk to Chris Bennett to, um, and get some of the other trying day writers talking. It's, uh, it's, um, yeah, it's a neat bunch of people and it's a, it's a neat perspective that, that Chris has brought, um, of just trying to poke through the BS that, you know, that keeps us constrained and keeps us from having complete full lives that, that, that are possible. Yeah. And if the concept of trying day is new to listeners, trying day.com, that word is trying T R I N E D A Y all together.com. And you'll find the books that this man, Chris Milligan has published truth behind the scenes stories that expose the lies that are killing us. The podcast of about 78, 79 episodes where Chris has interviewed a lot of his authors. Each episode is about 30 minutes and it's a curriculum to shed light on all these things behind the scenes that the mainstream and the politicians will never teach us. All right. I think that's it. So, uh, for this episode of Lost Goddess IO, it's Edward Dodge and Bruce de Torres. Until next time, thank you guys very much. Thank you.